So in, in the meantime, Peter, how, what, what are your thoughts so far on, uh, on the conference? I'm impressed. <laughs> I mean, you know, we've really got some really top quality companies in each of these uh, different sectors. And it's impressive to see uh, and encouraging to see how uh, there are really so many fantastic opportunities for the different metals that are all part of the green transition. I mean, it makes me want to, you know, just sort of uh, take a chunk of money and spread it all around. And <laughs> and yet, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to end up spreading it so thin. But uh, yeah, no, the potential really looks fantastic. And uh, these are really some some exciting companies to follow. Absolutely. And when it comes to the, the battery metals, um, are there any in particular, and any of the, the ones we've discussed so far in particular, that, that you're taking a look at these days from an investment perspective? Aside from silver, of course, we, we know the answer to that one. <laughs> I mean, given uh, the uh, the work that I do, which is mostly focused on silver, uh, not not specifically, but I do kind of loosely follow uh, things like graphite and lithium, and uh, and you know, sort of keep on top of how these uh, these uh, specialized metals really are uh, important for for uh, batteries. And it's interesting how graphite just has uh, on a quantity uh, perspective versus lithium. Uh, obviously, they're, they're both critical, but the quantity of graphite that goes into a battery is a multiple of the, the amount of lithium. And so I think that's something that probably gets uh, gets missed a lot by the market. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to touch on, on copper a little bit as well, because <clears throat> although copper is not traditionally known as a battery metal, it is so essential for electrification. As Jordy was saying in the Summa Silver presentation, silver is actually the most conductive when it comes to electricity. However, the cost is kind of prohibitive, which is one of the reasons why copper is used for a lot of electrification, most of the electrification. And it's also silver is a little more sensitive to heat as well, I believe. So copper plays a better role in that sense. But what a lot of people don't really discuss is how copper will impact the developing world. You know, we have a lot of emerging economies now where we're seeing the emergence of a new middle class, where fortunately people are able to move from poverty into a middle class. And copper is really at the heart of that particular transition within those societies as well, as, as people start to get more income and start to kind of electrify their lives and enjoy the, the life that, that us in, in the in the so-called developed world have enjoyed for decades. So um, I think copper is really one to watch. I think uranium is very important as well. Um, obviously it's not a battery metal, but it is essential for carbon free, a carbon free world. Um, and, you know, a lot of talk about wind and solar. Well, the, the piece of the puzzle that needs to fit in there is also uranium and nuclear because those intermittent power sources can get supported by this clean baseload form of energy that is extraordinarily efficient. So I think uranium is also a key part of the renewables kind of puzzle as, as it all comes together. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, and uh, it's, um, I completely agree. It's just too bad. I think that, you know, with, with the events in Fukushima in 2011, how all of that kind of got derailed and uh, it's unfortunate, and 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 to some extent, I understand because the appetite simply was not there. But uh, I think that it would have taken a bit more um, leadership, I guess, from a lot of uh, a lot of uh, countries around the world that uh, have the that have to some extent depended on uh, nuclear, and that have installations that have the technology and so on to have to some extent, you know, maybe pushed forward. And to maybe uh, go on a, some kind of an education campaign with their population and to explain to them, you know, maybe not to go sort of, you know, you don't want to go head to head. Uh, but uh, if you do it in a, a bit, bit more of a subtle way to explain not only the, the, um, the advantages, uh, but also the, the, the lower risks that you have with uranium, because uh, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but if you compare uh, the, you know, let's say a kilowatt uh, hour of electricity from uranium, versus coal versus natural gas versus even things and this will shock some people and, and again unfortunately I don't have the numbers at my fingertips but even compared to wind or solar um, uranium actually has the lowest uh, number of deaths per 
unit of energy produced. It's just, it's, it's really quite shocking to, to so many people. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it absolutely has a critical role and, and it's, um, it's great that people are really coming around to it. Not only governments, but I think um, the population at large really is starting to get the fact that uranium is, uh, is, is, is completely, absolutely essential to, um, to, to doing, to, to completing the green transition. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, the, the the concentration of energy in uranium is unmatched, and so it absolutely has to be a part of uh, of our future. Definitely, and we're we're certainly seeing a shift in sentiment politically. We've even got a lot of environmental groups now who are getting behind nuclear energy. You know, we've seen some nuclear uh, plants that were supposed to come offline by by really kind of reckless and misguided government policy. Um, Diablo Canyon in California, it, Germany's trying to keep on three of its nukes that it was planning to cancel. And we're seeing so many more being built out around the world. China's got a plan to build 150 reactors over, I think, a, a pretty short time span. Um, and then we've got the UAE, we've got um, India, we've got just countries around the world are embracing it. Um, of course, the Japanese are restarting their nuclear fleet. Um, so this is all great news for uranium. And I think when it comes to a lot of these, these metals as well, we're talking about copper, lithium, graphite, nickel, tin, a lot of people don't understand how much of these minerals we need for the green energy transition. A lot of people just take it for granted and think we can just shut everything off that we're using now and switch to renewables and get this moving. Everybody can drive an EV. But the fact is there is a massive supply squeeze at the moment there is not enough mines online to accomplish the mission right on time uh, in, in in the time frame that that the the policy makers are trying to to push through and so this is extraordinarily bullish for any uh metals minerals involved in the green transition and uh, i i think we're going to see um the prices of those commodities rise dramatically over the, the course of the next decade as as this whole situation with the transition is sort, sorted out. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. We are entering what uh, some call the age of scarcity. And uh, if, if we really want to move into this green transition, again, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, but we're talking in, in many of these metals, probably all of the metals that uh, are being covered in today's conference we're looking at in this next sort of, uh, I'm going to say 25 years or so, perhaps even the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to need to have dozens uh, of times, I'm talking dozens of times the current production um, of some of these metals. It really is off the charts and it's something that is tremendously underappreciated. And Actually, before when you were talking about uh, about um, uranium and and uh, nuclear energy and how it's uh, you have so many more countries that are really starting to open up to it and, and embrace it and move towards it, even you know traditionally um, uh, fossil fuel uh, producers like Saudi Arabia and so on, the whole sort of Middle East uh, and beyond. Um, Something that, uh, and again, I'm I'm not the expert in this, but uh, I you know I read enough to know that uh, technology is advancing tremendously in the whole uh, nuclear power um, sector as well, and so uh, from what I know, um, there are going to be smaller production. Um, plants or smaller nuclear power plants. The safety level is going up tremendously. We're learning a lot, um, you know, as technology advances. So these things will become safer. They'll become smaller. They'll be easier to build more quickly. They'll be spread around, um, you know, given jurisdictions instead of having to be concentrated. And I could certainly see, you know, we talked so much about copper, but I could certainly see that helping um, the, the requirement for things like copper, because if you don't have to, you know, build a huge plant in one place and then distribute that energy where you have losses, by the way, too, right? If you're you're sending electricity halfway across a country or a state or a province, um, there, there are losses in terms of power um, along the way on your power lines. So if you can do these things uh, more locally, and distribute the power more uh, closer to where it's being consumed. Um, you can have tremendous savings on the uh, on the other resources that help you to distribute the power. So uh, yeah, I mean, um, it, it, they're, they're really uh, there's there's no limit to the to the angles that um, you know we need to consider when we look at 
uh, the metals, the technologies around them, and the implications. And uh, yeah, this is this is not something that's going away. There's no question. Yeah, I'd like to touch a little bit here on uh, solar technology as well. And uh, you, you've written about this in your book. Um, Gwen Preston has spoken about it. Uh, Chen Lin, another big silver advocate who's spoken about this. The role of silver in solar panels and how now they're actually making solar panels that need more silver than a than a typical solar panel. Could you maybe talk about the supply demand fundamentals that are that are going on there? Yeah, it's 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 amazing. Actually, if you look at so currently. Um, Solar is, uh, if you look at all of the silver supply every year, solar represents something like 12 to 13% of, of all the silver that's consumed every year, just solar. Um, and so if you look at the International Energy Agency's projections over just the next eight years, so they see that um, solar is going to probably require as much as... Um, or they think that energy from solar should be up by eight to nine times current levels. So, I mean, I'm just doing simple math in my head. And if solar now takes more than 10% and you're going to multiply the output from solar by nine times, I mean, technically, if I got my math right, solar alone could account for or or would account for all of the product, all of the requirements of silver in just sort of the next decade. It's, it's just really off the charts so we haven't even accounted for new technologies in solar, um, which the next technology apparently should use as much as 25 to 50% more silver per panel. And the technology to follow on that could require as much as 150% more silver than we currently need per panel. And, you know, the technologies are really advancing quickly in solar as well. You've got things like multi-layer um, solar panels. That means that you'll have multiple layers within the panel, each of them requiring silver. You have some that um, will, that, that actually are two-sided panels. And so let's say uh, in, in some certain places, the, the applications make, make sense. Let's say you you are somewhere out, you know, in the North or in the winter. And if the panel, you know, on the, on the underneath side, depending on how the angle is placed can reflect off of snow, um, you know, it's obviously not exposed directly to the sunlight, but the reflection off of the snow can certainly uh, generate plenty of light towards the, the underneath of the panel. If you're in places where, um, let's say you're in a desert somewhere and there is sand or a light colored ground beneath, you know, um, again, light colors will, will reflect the light and help generate uh, electricity on the other side of the panel. So you have all these things in the pipeline and all of them are going to just keep pushing the requirements of silver. And, you know, we've just talked about, uh, we've just talked about solar in terms of silver requirements, but really the list goes on electronics, uh, 5G, um, medical, the ends are, the, the applications are, are really limitless. Right, absolutely. There's there's certainly a lot of excitement there. I'm very bullish on silver. I'm very bullish on uranium. I'm bullish on a lot of the things that we're discussing today. I'd like to get your take on on jurisdiction when it comes to to mining these these minerals. Um, for yourself, when you're when you're taking a look at at jurisdiction, what what are the things that you look for in in a mining company? We can use silver as an example because that's your specialty. Sure. So uh, you know. You want to look for potential. I mean, the, f the first thing is obviously going to be uh, the quote unquote friendliness of the jurisdiction. Uh, if no matter what the size of the of the project is, if you don't have, um, you know, a, uh, a, a political, uh, if you don't have political support for this kind of activity, then you're really barking up the wrong tree. Uh, and so you know, I have certain filters. For me, that means that, uh, you know, there's some, you know, North America, so Canada, the US and Mexico are great places. Mexico is the world's largest producer of silver, almost double the next, which is, uh, which are Peru and China, who are basically almost tied in terms of the quantity of silver that they produce. And then from there, it actually falls off pretty quickly. Uh, but so those are the three big ones. Um, and if I look at jurisdictions, like I say, I like uh, all of North America, some parts of South America, I'm open to. Um, you've got places like, uh, say, Australia, Europe, uh, but really, you know, to find um, silver deposits, even if we're talking about polymetallic deposits that have a fair 
uh, amount of silver content in them, you there aren't that many places. The uh, the the most um, the most silver you're going to find are in places like uh, Canada, the U.S., um, Mexico, to some extent, Colombia, uh, to some extent, uh, Chile, because it's uh, mixed in in polymetallic uh, deposits with with copper, uh, Peru as well, again with the copper. Bolivia. Uh, now that's uh, a jurisdiction that I find interesting because um, I feel like uh, Bolivia is actually probably as much as a decade ahead of other places, uh, places like, like I say, Peru and Chile, um, that are perhaps a little bit less mm, receptive, you know, to to some of the the mining activity. Bolivia, I think, has been there. They've done that. Uh, they've they've uh, dealt with the consequences of it. And they they seem to be considerably more proactive and and welcoming uh, when it comes to mining, and um, I think it's a, it's a, a jurisdiction that has a whole lot of potential. There are a few companies that are operating there, some very big um, uh, public uh, silver companies have been operating there for decades, uh, operating successfully, by the way, and so. I think uh, as for silver, really, that is um, probably uh, uh, quite a bit of an up and coming place. You know what happens too is these jurisdictions when they, when they, uh, when they go for for so many years, um, and they're they're perhaps considered not as receptive to to some uh, mining activities, then needless to say, little uh, little resources get spent there. Um, and then as technology advances and we get better at finding deposits, uh, these become very prospective all of a sudden. When, when they become attractive again geopolitically and as a jurisdiction, then um, they can open up tremendously in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uncovering and, and revealing uh, deposits. And that's, that's, you know, one of the ways that, uh, that, I, that I've approached uh, Bolivia. And, uh, in, you know, in my newsletter, there is one company that I'm comfortable with. They have uh, large share um, ownership uh, from, from other large silver producers that have been operating in that, in that country for a long time. So really the ingredients are all there. Um, then you've got a few other places. You've got, uh, to some extent, places like Poland um, that produces a fair bit of silver. You've got Russia as well. Now, those are issues uh, because of obviously the war in Ukraine and potential limits in terms of uh, silver coming out of Russia. Um, and you've also got uh, China. China is, like I mentioned before, um, you know, a, 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 it's, it's second, um, second place, probably, as I say, very close to Peru in terms of uh, the amount of silver that it produces. But um, with China, uh, I, I'm again, a little bit reticent. Is, and that's because we, we've we seen, and I talk about that, it's actually in the book, we saw how uh, a few years back, um, China put uh, quotas on its uh, rare earth um, elements. Again, it dominates that uh, sector as well. And uh, so the, the quotas meant that it was a lot more expensive for uh, non-Chinese companies to uh, to import those materials. They had to pay a lot more for them uh, if they were able to get to them at all. Um, and that got challenged at uh, the um, um, World Trade Organization. Uh, it was appealed. Eventually, the uh, the challengers won. But years had gone by, you know, when they were all this time paying more for those commodities. So to tell you honestly, I could see how um, silver could before long, again, given its importance in so many ways and so many of these uh, technologies for the green transition, could potentially be be treated as a strategic metal. And so, um, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm a bit sort of hesitant in terms of uh, production that comes out of China. So you really have to look at um, at the history and how uh, different governments treat uh, uh, that mining, that, that part of their, their mining sector for, uh, for the industry. Absolutely. And I have received notification that uh, David Patterson is unable to attend due to technical difficulties, but we are on schedule for 10-1 at noon. So that will be coming up in about four minutes here. Um, so just before that, I guess my final question for you, Peter, is the term ESG gets thrown around a lot. Um, sometimes it's not done so honestly, but ESG done right. How important is that for in terms of uh, opening a mind these days. I think it's become more important than ever. So what, what, what are your thoughts there? 
Yeah, there's no question. It's more important than ever. And uh, I mean, you know, uh, more and more countries, not just uh, what we would maybe call the advanced uh, economies, but also uh, the developing economies, they're really taking that to heart. Um, they're, they're being serious about it. Uh, their laws are developing along those lines as well. And um, research has shown that uh, companies that that do apply uh, ESG policies and, and do so in in a in a in an honest way, in a legitimate way, actually tend to do better. Um, they act, their their stock prices tend to actually perform better, and so it's a win win. Actually, if you if you look at the um, you know the application of, of what ESG means. So you know for anybody watching, if uh, they're not uh, completely familiar, it's environmental, social, and governance. And so that's when a, com a company um, makes makes certain and and it's part of their internal operating uh, procedures and policies that they're going to um, not just follow the requirements but be proactive in many ways when it comes to dealing with the environment. The social side is, you know, many times it ends up being uh, dealing with First Nations, not necessarily. Um, you know, you could have, for example, I've, I've seen many cases in, in Mexico where you're not necessarily deal, dealing with um, Indigenous populations, but just locals. You know, you could be operating mine. You know, Mexico has uh, centuries of history of, of mining silver, for example. And, um, you know, if, if you make a point of hiring locals, training locals, then they become uh, very loyal to you. And um, it, it, again, it just, you know, becomes a win-win. I've, I've seen it myself. I was on a, uh, on a, um, on a, uh, I was vis visiting a site uh, this past summer in, in Mexico. And uh, I was so impressed at how uh, the, the locals who represented, I'm going to say probably over 95% of, of the uh, of the employees at this company, um, they really truly were, uh, you know, not only uh, uh, well trained, but they were proactive. They were serious about looking for ways to help the company because they knew that the bottom line meant it, it was it was good for them. It was good for the company. It was good for the environment. It was good for the next generations. So they really, uh, they really took it to heart, and um, that's absolutely part of uh, of ESG. And the and the final part is uh, is governance, and uh, that's you know how a company will, as I say, you know, f uh, act uh, and mm -hmm. and in, um, bring along policies that uh, that manage how they manage their companies, how to do so ethically. And, um, and again, just, you know, be on, on the right side of, of, uh, of running a public company. Absolutely. That was a great recap. That was a, a great filler of time. You dropped so much wisdom on us, Peter. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so as mentioned, David Patterson is not able to attend from Quebec Nickel due to technical issues. We should have Tin One up shortly. Um, so we'll be waiting for Chris Donaldson. And um, in the meantime, we'll just take a very brief moment and uh, we'll, we'll be right back as soon as Tin One comes online. Thank you.